What's going on, 8th graders? This is Miss Paterba, guest starring on Mr. Kalman's YouTube channel. Thanks so much for having me, RC. Today we are going to talk about Newton's laws of motion, so you should be following along in your guided notes handout or on OneNote. So our first law of motion has two parts. One is that objects at rest stay at rest, and the second is that objects in motion stay in motion. And those two things will happen unless the object is acted on by an unbalanced force. So here's a couple examples of that. An object at rest. So a chair is not going to just slide across the floor, right? Here's a chair on the ground. It's not going to move. It wants to stay at rest. If Miss Barry comes along and pushes the chair, then the chair would start to move. That would be your unbalanced force. Similarly, an object in motion, so a golf ball flying through the air, let's say, the golf ball is going to keep going through the air until an unbalanced force acts on it. So that could be that maybe it's a really bad shot and the golf ball hits a tree, right? Then the golf ball stops because there's something in the way. That's the unbalanced force. Or maybe it keeps on going and then eventually falls to the ground. Well, there's actually a force acting on it here too. That force is gravity. Eventually, gravity will pull the ball down. And so when we're thinking about the sources of unbalanced forces, oftentimes it'll be a person or an object coming along to push something, or the, the unbalanced force that stops the object might be an object that's in the way. But there's two forces that we want to remember, friction and gravity. With your mousetrap car, friction slowed the car down until it stopped. It also might have prevented your car from moving. And gravity is always going to pull things down. If they're in the air, eventually they'll hit the ground. And so those two forces are important to remember in Newton's first law. And Newton's first law of motion is also called the law of inertia. And so inertia is the tendency of objects to resist changes in motion. That basically means that inertia is why an object stays at rest or stays in motion. Objects don't want to change what they're doing. Right? If you think about, like, I like to think about inertia as like the runner's high when you're running and you've run like six miles or something and you just would rather keep going than stop. I've never done that in my life, but I hear people who run say that. <laughs> so the way that we measure inertia is with mass. Mass tells us that if we have more mass, we have more inertia, it's harder to move a bigger object. We know that, right? So when you're thinking about inertia, Think about the mass of the objects. Here's an example. If we roll a softball versus a bowling ball. Here's our softball. It's a pretty small object. Here's our bowling ball. If we try to roll the softball, it has less inertia than the bowling ball because it has less mass, which means it's going to be easier to move it, right? It only has a little bit of inertia that wants to keep it where it is. The bowling ball, however, has more mass which means it has more inertia and it's harder to move. And so we would need to apply more force to move the bigger object. Pretty intuitive. Here's a couple more examples if you're interested. This cup example is kind of like the magician pulling the dishes tablecloth out and then all the dishes stay in one spot on the table, right? If anyone's ever seen that. Take away the cloth and all of a sudden they're still there. So when we pull this paper very slowly, the coin wants to stay where it is. The coin stays on the paper, right? It's because we're not using very much force here, the coin will stay on the paper and it'll go with it. If all of a sudden we come with a lot of force and pull the paper very fast, that coin wants to stay where it is. And in that case, because the paper's moving quickly, where it is is right on top of that glass. And so the paper disappears and the coin falls into the cup. Another quick example kind of like comparing the softball and the bowling ball, is we have an empty pail and a pail full of sand. Obviously, the empty pail has less inertia because it has less mass, and this pail full of sand has more inertia, and so that would be harder to move. We would need more force. And here's another way to think about the first law. Newton made a second law, and they're pretty much related. So this second law of motion is all about our force equation, F equals ma. Acceleration of an object depends on the mass of an object and the amount of force supplied. That's just a way to explain force equals mass times acceleration in words. So thinking about how acceleration depends on mass, as we just talked about, it's easier to accelerate an object with a small mass than a large mass. We know that. Easier to move smaller objects. 
thinking about force, if you increase the force, the acceleration of an object increases. We can think about that, here's a box, let's say, and we come along and we push it with five newtons of force. And then we come along and push the same box with 20 newtons of force. Well, this one is going to accelerate less, right? Let's say the box is 10 kilograms. If you simply plug that in to F equals MA, we would get 5 equals 10 A. A is 0.5. Here we come along, plug into F equals MA. A is 2. Right? So if you use more force on the same mass, the acceleration will go up. Here's another example of the second law. So throwing a tennis ball versus a soccer ball. Here's our tennis ball. Less mass. This one relates to mass, right? That's the first part of Newton's second law. Less mass, less inertia. It's going to be easier to move. It's going to have more acceleration. And you don't need to draw this out. You can just write down the example. If we have a soccer ball, that's going to go through the air a bit slower, right? Because it has more mass. I did not know I was going to commit to drawing a soccer ball. All right. There it is. Pretty good. So this one is going to have less acceleration because it has more mass and more inertia. So if we're hitting that with the same force, throwing the ball, it's not going to move as, as fast. Excuse me. Here's another one, hammering a nail lightly versus with more force. Sorry that my writing's in the way. So if we have a nail and we're trying to maybe hammer it into a piece of wood, if we only use a little bit of force, let's do our five newtons again, the nail's not going to move very fast. It might get a little further into the wood, but not entirely. Um, here, if we apply 20 newtons of force, maybe that's enough force to get the nail to move down because it had more acceleration. Two examples to think about. And then there's one more thinking about Newton's second law and gravity. If you do not understand this picture, that's okay. Uh, this is basically showing you the calculations to go through to find out that if you drop an apple and a watermelon on Earth, they both accelerate at 9.8 meters per second squared or 10 meters per second squared, which is our acceleration due to gravity, right? It shows you the masses of the objects, how gravity would have a larger force on the watermelon because it's a bigger object, and then kind of going through some units to cancel out and find the acceleration of the object. Again, you do not need to know how to read this diagram. All you need to know is that objects accelerate down at the same rate, and that rate is the acceleration due to gravity. That is the case if there's no air resistance. So this is where our example of the brick versus the feather that you probably learned about when you were younger if you were to drop both of these objects and they hit the ground at the same time, that would be if they're in a vacuum sealed chamber with no air resistance. There's no wind, there's no air, there's nothing to make the feather float down, right? So if we do not have any air, we have no air resistance whatsoever, vacuum sealed, these objects would hit the ground at the same time because they both accelerate down at our acceleration due to gravity. All right, Newton's third law of motion, a little bit different from the first two. We'll kind of run through these examples. I'm going to finish this video in 15 minutes. That's my promise to you. Alrighty, so whenever one object exerts force on a second object, the second object exerts an equal and opposite force on the first. Long story short, that means that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. That's probably the way you've heard this law before. And so we say that all forces act in pairs, an action force and a reaction force. Thinking about just a quick example, we're going to run through a bunch in a second. Let's say that I am jumping in basketball. If I push down on the ground with my feet, the ground is going to push back up on my shoes, which allows me to jump. That's our action force and reaction force. So here's some examples. If we are sitting in a chair, our weight pushes down on the chair. That's our action force but the chair is going to push back up to hold us there, right? Just like we talked about at the beginning of the force unit when we talked about normal force, that normal force of the chair is going to push back up against us and hold us on the chair. It balances us out. It's equal and it's opposite, opposite direction. So your action force is you push down on chair, 
and you can write this in whatever words make sense to you. The reaction force is the chair pushes up against you and it's going to hold you there. Nice and easy, right? Identify the action force. It's usually what the object is doing in the first place. The reaction force is what that other object is doing back. In swimming, when you swim, you kind of cup the water and push it backwards. That's your action force. The hand hits the water and tries to scoop it backwards. But then the water is going to push against your hand, which is what allows you to move forward, right? That like propels you forward as you kind of run your hand through the water. The water has to push back. Otherwise, if your hand just kept going, right, and it didn't have any sort of action or reaction force to push against it, you probably wouldn't move as much. So your action force is that swimmer's hand pushes the water. And I know it's kind of written here for you. And then the water pushes back against the hand. So now we're going into that little table on your note sheet. Here we go. Here's a few examples. Here's a rabbit. The rabbit pushes down on the earth. The earth pushes up against the rabbit. And that is what allows the rabbit to accelerate forward, just like the swimmer, right? We don't see the earth pushing up against the rabbit, but we know that otherwise the rabbit would have just been pulled to the center of the earth. So action force, rabbit pushes earth. Reaction force is that earth pushes rabbit. Another example, we have a space shuttle. The thrusters push exhaust down. That's your action force, right? You're pushing all of these gases down and then the gases have to push back up with an equal force in order for the rocket to move up into the atmosphere. Again, you can pause this to write down these examples. As long as you have a couple, I'm happy with that. Here's our last one, a ball with gravity. Earth is pulling the ball down. That's your action force, right? Earth has gravity that pulls the ball towards it. But the ball is actually pulling the Earth towards it too. Kind of weird. We don't see the Earth move. So let's talk about that. That's your action force, reaction force. So why do we only see one object move? Let's think about this example with the ball. So Earth has a really large mass, right? If here's, here's Earth and here's the ball it's trying to pull down, if the ball is pulling Earth towards it with the same amount of force, we're not going to see the Earth move because it's so much bigger than the ball, right? It all has to do with the mass. We're not going to see the giant planet Earth move just because a ball is pulling it towards it a little bit. And so the ball is going to move more. That's your answer in the blank on your worksheet. Here's another example of one object moving more. This is a cannon example, and I'm going to show you how to do a cannon problem in just a second. So when the cannon is fired, the cannonball goes flying, and the cannon itself moves back just a little bit, right? The force that the cannon exerts on the cannonball is equal to the force that the cannonball exerts on the cannon. That's why there's that kick and it kind of goes backwards. Same thing if um, you're at a gun range and you were to shoot a gun, you have the little, the little kick that happens that you see in the movies. That's why. So there's that equal and opposite force. And so why does the cannonball move more? Because the mass is so much bigger of this cannon, it's not going to move as much. That's inertia, right? More mass, less likely to move. And so you can look at this with the equation, right? The cannonball has a smaller mass, and so it's going to accelerate more. The cannon has a bigger mass. It's going to accelerate less. And I'm going to make another video for you to see cannon problems because I promised you 15 minutes of notes, so stay tuned. Only 14 and a half. Thanks for watching.